Good evening. My name is Richard Lawson. I'm the Dean of St. John's Cathedral, and I'm joined by Dr. Kwok Pulan, our Everding lecturer, and I'm delighted to say that I'm also joined by Lee Everding, whom I will um, introduce in just a moment. Um, Pulan, good to see you. Welcome from Atlanta. And um, before I introduce you as well, again, let us pray. I've picked a prayer, <clears throat> since we're doing a Bible study, I've picked a prayer that has to do with God um, enlightening us through the, through the stories of Scripture. Almighty God, we thank you for the gift of your holy word. May it be a lantern to our feet, a light to our paths, and a strength to our lives. Take us and use us to love and serve all your people in the power of the Holy Spirit and in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Pulan, it's good to see you again. And as some of our guests know, um, we had a, a wonderful conversation with you last Sunday as a part of the Dean's Forum, your initial lecture here at St. John's Cathedral. Um, Dr. Kwok Pulan is our um, 2021 Everding speaker. And the Everdings lectures were um, founded um, at with a joint collaboration between Isla School of Theology and St. John's Cathedral. And they are named um, after Lee and Ed Everding. Ed Everding, God rest his soul, was a New Testament professor. So it's very fitting that tonight is a Bible study on a, one of Matthew's great stories. And Ed was also the dean of Isla School of Theology. And it's an honor, Lee, to welcome you. Good to see you. Well, I am delighted to be here because I really wanted to hear you speak. And so the, at least I've got this opportunity and welcome to Denver and to St. John's. Uh, Miss Everdeen, I'm just uh, so grateful for your generosity for making this lectureship uh, possible. Yesterday, I was able to address the wider I Live community and I have had a great uh, uh, fun doing all these uh, lectures, and tonight I'm looking forward to do this Bible study with Dean Lawson. I thank you for your ministry and also for Ed's uh, wonderful serving the Lord for so many years. That's wonderful. Lee, thank you. Yes. So Lee's going to um, shift to a chair in my office and be alongside us. I know if she has a, a question, I'll be sure to get to it. And I, what I'd like to do next is just do a brief introduction again, Pulan. Um, it's really an honor to have you. You are the professor of systematic theology at Candler School of Theology at Emory University, one of this country's um, and this world's great universities and an outstanding um, theological department. You're the author of many um, publications, including the forthcoming book, book which will be pu published by the end of the year and available before the end of the year, Postcolonial Politics and Theology. And of course, you are closely associated with postcolonial theology, and we'll be able to talk about that in a bit. You're also an Episcopalian and... Um, and, and, and an Episcopalian who teaches at a, at a great uh, university that's historically associated with the Methodist Church. I love School of Theology is still closely associated with the Methodist Church, but you're an Episcopalian. And here we are at the Episcopal Cathedral for the Episcopal Church in Colorado. Um, one of your most recent honors is that you received just this year the um, Lambeth Award. Um, from the Archbishop of Canterbury, and it's called the Landfrack Award for Education and Scholarship, and it cited you as a remarkable individual who's brought a unique and much-needed voice to Anglican theological thinking. Your Asian, female, and Anglican identities are a key locus for your work, exploring your own story, the developing of new hermeneutics. All of this has opened spaces for others whose stories were unseen and unheard. What a fantastic um, description of, of you and your work. Welcome back. Thank you. It's really good to see you. So we are going to be um, 
doing a Bible study. And in just a moment, um, Tina will put in the comments section our Bible study so that everyone can see it. And I, I thought that I would begin Pulan by simply um, reading it. But first I'll draw attention to, this is um, Matthew's gospel. It's Matthew chapter 15, um, verse 21 through 28. Um, so again, Matthew 15, verses 21 through 28. Jesus left that place and went away to the district of Tyre and Sidon. Just then a Canaanite woman from that region came out and started shouting, Have mercy on me, Lord, son of David. My daughter is tormented by a demon. But Jesus did not answer her at all. And his disciples came and urged him, saying, Send her away, for she keeps shouting after us. Jesus answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But she came and knelt before him, saying, Lord, help me. He answered, It is not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. She said, Yes, Lord, yet even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Then Jesus answered her, Woman, great is your faith. Let it be done for you as you wish. And her daughter was healed instantly. Pulan, fascinating story. This is a, a story that's yeah. fascinated mm -hmm. for, for, for many, many um, years. And here's where I want to begin. Um, she is a, a Canaanite woman. And we know that because Matthew says that, or, Ma or the editors of Matthew's gospel point that out. So they're highlighting this for us just so that we can't miss it. She's a Canaanite woman. And I know that um, the Canaanites were one of Israel's traditional enemies. And um, the Canaanites were associated with the worship of Baal. So what we have here at the very beginning of this story is, um, is a story about two groups that are in, in tremendous conflict. And these two groups come from two different places, separated by a boundary. And I want to say something about the boundary in just a minute. But, but before we do that, what's your um, sort of uh, initial impression of this story and, and, and this, these two different groups? This story is of interest to me for a long time, too, because um, you have Jesus meeting a Gentile woman. A um, woman who is uh, from the Canaanite community. And I recall that Jesus has met other women. For example, in John chapter 4, the Samaritan women. And each time uh, we have learned a great deal from these uh, stories. Not only that, Jesus traveled to a foreign land, that is, the district of Tyre and Sidon. So Jesus went to a foreign land and met this Canaanite women. Something is going to be happening uh, because the setting is extraordinary, isn't it? Extraordinary, extraordinary. So that's the second point that I wanted to make. Um, so we, this is a story about two different groups of people. And it's a story about a, a, a boundary, um, geographical, um, lines that exist. So you've already mentioned Tyre and Sidon. And then in verse 22, we get, and this is the NRSV translation, just then a Canaanite woman from that region came out and started shouting. So one of the things, one of the resources that I'm using um, that I, I will also commend to everyone, it's called the Jewish annotated new testament have you come across this pulan yes yeah it's it's Very a wonderful yeah it's a really um good resource and and one of the editors is someone whose work you admire um your colleague at vanderbilt divinity school amy jill levine um, who is a jewish scholar and one of her areas of expertise is interestingly enough the parables of jesus and her book on the parables of jesus is spectacular. She's one of the editors. 
that in my footnote on this story, in this image of the Canaanite woman, woman from that region came out and started shouting. Here's what the footnote says. For verse 22. came out, Jesus and the woman meet at the border. It's not clear necessarily that Jesus enters the Gentile district, but it's we're certain from this phrase that Jesus and the woman meet at the border. That's fascinating. Mm -hmm. What does that bring to mind for you? I think that um, this is the context song, uh, according to post-colonial scholars. In the context song, you have people from that different backgrounds meeting each other. And so um, we look at the context song as full of possibilities for confrontation, but it might be also full of possibilities for new encounter and new relations to happen. It's depending on what happened in the context song and how women and men, people of different culture and different religions will uh, build relations or they will confront each other. So this already sets the tone for the story. You have read the context song, the border of uh, Tyre and Sudan, and the two very different persons meeting at that place and uh, going to have something that really triggers our imagination. Yes, and I, and I want to just flag here another border that always is kind of hovering over the gospel stories, but I think hovering over in this one especially, and we'll perhaps come back to this later. Another border is the relationship, the place of meeting between the human and the divine is another border always. Well, as you said, at these boundaries, at these borders, um, something really complex can happen. Something really vivid can happen. Something very wonderful can happen. And, and your work is also a testimony to all of the above can happen, and even simultaneously. What we know at the beginning of the story is the way Matthew tells it, is that Jesus did not answer her at all. Jesus did not answer her at all. And in the original language, the, the verb here for answer um, is not simply to answer. Like if you ask me a question and I give you a straight answer or, or ignore your question, it's not just that. It also means to speak or even to converse, to be in a dialogue. So it means that it could mean that Jesus is not yet even in a conversation with her, not even related to her at the level of language. And he doesn't, doesn't answer her at all. And that's compounded by the fact that in the um, next verse or the next part of that verse, 23b, and his disciples came and urged him saying, send her away for she keeps shouting at us. This is so dramatic and troubling. Yeah, what do you make it is, um, of that? Yes, quite troubling. But before we talk about Jesus, I want to uh, point out it is not common to have a woman speaking in gospel stories. Mm. Very often, the women were seen. Okay, for example, remember that story that a woman touched Jesus' garment and get healed. She did not say something. At least her words were not recorded. But here it is very interesting. First, the woman started shouting in verse 22. That is quite extraordinary. You have a woman shouting. Why did she need to shout? Maybe Jesus was walking with the disciples or Jesus disregarded her, as you said. So she came out and shouting. And then actually the Bible recorded this woman's word, have mercy on me, isn't it? Lord, son of David. And then Jesus did not answer her at all, as you said. And then when, she, when he answered and uh, was trying maybe to respond, his uh, disciples obstructed the way and asked Jesus, 
to send her away. Well, this woman persisted, isn't it? First, kept shouting, and then the disciple said, "Send her away." She remained steadfast there, and then finally, Jesus did respond. So I think that this persistence of the women is something I want to lift up. Do not give up. Uh, grace uh, will be available, but what kind of uh, perseverance? I would say, in a context song, when the women was not so sure who this person Jesus was and what she might be getting from that encounter. So I think that this story is dra dramatic from the beginning. Mm -hmm. it, it is, and I'm going to. Um... I'm going to move us because you just said that I'm going to move us to the end of the story and then we'll, we'll, we'll go back up in a moment because there's a lot more in the middle of the story that we need to talk about. But since you just said that, um, the end of the story, Jesus says, woman, great is your faith. Um, so it's interesting that he calls her woman. I, I would, I would love to hear you say something about that in a moment because we see that from time to time. Um, for example, when I think about in John's gospel, um, when Jesus is on the cross and says to the beloved disciple, behold, your mother, woman, here is your son. He says to his mother, Mary, woman, here is your son. And here is your mother, he says to the be beloved disciple. So that, that title woman, you know, Jesus here acknowledges the gender. But before that, he commends her, or after that, he commends her faith. And I interpret her faith to be, in part, exactly what you just said. Not this kind of intellectual, not just an intellectual faith, although it is very intellectual. I want to say something about that. But her persistence, that's your word. Um, I would use the word um, grit, grit. Um, she keeps going. Her faith, so so it has something to do with persistence or grit, and it absolutely has something to do with a kind of uh, emotional and intellectual confidence. And the reason why I say emotional and intellectual confidence is because she she argues with Jesus, um, and she's witty, and she's quick on her feet. So, do you agree that what her faith that's being committed is not just the tr is not just trust, but is sticking with it? her grit, and her intellectual conversation and even argument that she has with her Savior, that's or with, with this healer. That's a part of the faith, isn't it? It's the yeah. intellectual part of it. And not only that, afterwards, she disappeared from the rest of the gospel. That is, the Bible did not say she then followed Jesus. And that is why that is uh, an interesting question. What is that faith? I agree fully with you. That is, she has that greed, she has this uh, perseverance, and um, but has she become a follower of, of Jesus or not? We did not know. That is why it opens the possibility that she may not become a follower of Jesus. Why I said this is important? Because this story has been interpreted for a very long time to say that Jesus met the Canaanite women and then Jesus' mission was enlarged or expanded because of this encounter. And in Christian church, then this story has been used to say now Gentile can also become Christians. This is what the lesson from this story is. But from a religiously pluralistic world, that is, for example, if you are talking about Asian or African, or even in some parts of Latin America, there are so many people who may or may not follow Jesus. Um, in Asia, as we know that, Christianity is really a minority uh, religion in many parts, except uh, in the Philippines. Then I think, they might read this story quite differently. That is, no, it is not about a Gentile being converted 
or became a follower of Jesus. Even so, Jesus extended his compassion. I think you can read it both ways. You can say that she became a follower of Jesus. And you can also say she remained a Canaanite and did not then follow Jesus as a follower. But Jesus still had compassion, healed the daughter. So I think this faith can be, as you said, uh, expanded in these uh, connotations. It may not be our usual way of saying you need to have faith in Jesus, yes. and that is why you will be saved. Here, yes. Jesus said, wow, great is your faith. Jesus did not praise so many people with the same words. So again, the ending is just very interesting and a lot for us to think about today. Yes. So I, I am so glad. I mean, that, that, that you said that, that is fascinating. And so I just want to highlight this for everybody who's with us or watch the video later. I mean, this is where, um, you know, we come to a story like this and we need to be careful and try to be self-aware of what our assumptions that we bring to the story that we might read into the story. So for example, a, a Christian or an evangelical Christian or an evangelical Episcopalian might assume that Jesus is commending her faith in, in Jesus, in himself. But that actually, if, if you begin to really think about it in the way that you did, that's far from clear. It's one possible reading, but it's far from clear. And it's actually not the clearest, simplest reading of the story. The clearer, simpler reading of the story, the more straightforward reading, is that the faith that he is, is commending has something to do with her perseverance, something to do with her, her, her intellect and her rapport and her wit and her sticking it out in that conversation. Um, that could be the faith that's be, being commended. And then as you say, she returns to her own region. Um, and, and, and who knows what or where she worships or, or what are, you know, what she does there. We just don't know. We can make some assumptions, but we just don't know. Fascinating. Yeah, because uh, in Mark's version, it concluded like this. Jesus said to her, for saying that you may go, the demon has left your daughter. Then she went home found the child lying on the bed and the demon gone. So this story uh, can also be found in uh, Mark. And uh, so you have different endings and, and in that uh, version. And then it did not talk about uh, the woman's faith. So I think looking at the ending, it is rather ambiguous uh, as to whether she became a follower or not. So it is open to interpretation and imagination. Yes. Well, I'll give two more. Um, actually, I'll give uh, yeah, two more very quick examples, and, and then we'll move back up to the middle of the story. But this past Sunday, I preached on, because it was the appointed gospel, Mark's version of the, of the rich man, or what Matthew calls the rich young ruler, a rich young man. And, and Jesus does tell that person to go sell all of your possessions, give it to the poor and follow thou me. We tend to, especially those of us of a more evangelical ilk, tend to see that as the model and, and, and perhaps project it onto stories like this one. To give another example of someone who Jesus, where the ending is ambiguous in terms of some, the person probably does not become a, a follower of Jesus or we don't know, is the Gerasene demoniac. So that very dramatic story, when, when the Gerasene demoniac is healed, Jesus returns him to his village, to his people. Um, and, and there's no evidence of him following Jesus. So it's just a good reminder that we don't need to bring the model of following Jesus to all of these characters and all of these stories. Um, they may not have. 
but yet they had this very positive, in the end, very positive interaction with Jesus, a healing, a good word, etc. But let's go back up to the top. Let's go back up to the top. So this conversation that eventually does occur, um, something changes. Jesus at first does not answer or converse. The apostles are, are urging him to send her away. And something changes for him. Uh, we don't know what. Matthew doesn't tell us. But, but something changes for Jesus where he does begin to be engaged. Um, I was sent, Jesus says, only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. That's pretty, pretty clear. What is what is that? What do you think Jesus means there? I, I think I know. But what do you think he means there? I think that it is rather clear that uh, Jesus was saying that um, his ministry uh, was to the uh, people uh, of uh, Israel. And uh, she, being a Canaanite woman, should not be begging Jesus for help. Uh, you recall that as uh, earlier, you reminded us, the Canaanites, they were considered unclean. They were considered Gentiles, vis-a-vis uh, -vis the Jews. And so Jesus was very clear that my ministry, my calling, was to uh, the people of Israel. And that is why um, that entered later the great exchange between the women and Jesus. And at that point, I, I think it's fair to say that, that so many of us, if we were in this, this, the shoes of the Canaanite woman, the situation of the Canaanite woman, so many of us, I believe, would be tempted to give up at that very moment. He's told me no. I'm not a member of the House of Israel. But she does the opposite. She, she, she draws closer to him, kneels, and says, um, Lord, help me. And then he answers, it's not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. Is this the worst moment in the gospel in, in terms of what we see of Jesus? That, that's not the Jesus we sort of know and love. Uh, I can't think of another example in the gospels where Jesus talks this way in, in such a just troubling way and calls someone basically a dog. Yeah, it is very hard for us to hear, isn't it? Especially yes. uh, this is said uh, to us, uh, a woman, and also a Canaanite. So as if Jesus is reinforcing the boundaries that you have described. Yes. That is, first of all, I am not going to help a Canaanite. And you are a woman. And uh, you are um, inferior to a Jewish man. So you can see the encounter was not of equal uh, positionality. She came and kneeled before him. She had something to bad. But Jesus would not budge. And that is yes. why some of the scholars have tried to save Jesus from that harsh image. They said, well, the Greek word for the dogs really means puppies. So to uh, lessen the insult. But still, not to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. Anyone would consider this as rather demeaning, isn't it? Yes. Or refusing to help her. So I think over the uh, centuries, people have been wrestling with, why did Jesus say that? And uh, well, as you said, that was so atypical. Jesus, uh, in other occasions, seems to be much more embracing, much more gentle and kind. But is it precisely because of this, that something happened in the story that really changed our understanding and also really shocked us, isn't it? Yes, yes. Now, I want to ask you a, a very, um, I want to do, this is a non sequitur. This is, this is, I want to ask something out of sorts and get a quick response from you. And then we'll get back to the text because I'm leaving the story for a moment. You're, you're a systematic theologian. Um, and, and your field of thought is, as a systematic theologian, is, is, to look, is to be systematic. And you're looking for, in terms of our beliefs about 
Jesus or God or the Spirit, continuity and consistently consistency. Does one of the classical beliefs about Jesus is that Jesus is is sinless, is without sin. When you see a story like this, I don't think the story means necessarily that he's sinful, but it does mean that his 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 understanding was was um, not as evolved as as God and this woman needed it to be. How do you reconcile this terrible answer and the intellectual or faith development of Jesus in this passage with sort of the classical belief that he is sinless? Those two things don't exactly go together. Well, I must uh, remind the audience that Jesus is fully human too, isn't it? Yeah. It is precisely because of Jesus' humanity uh, that we relate to him so much when reading a story like this or other stories. Why? Jesus wept. Wow, that was very moving. Uh, Jesus sometimes um, almost like cursing. Remember that he, he and his disciples were hungry and then could not find food um, and then say the, uh, almost like cursing the fig tree. Uh, Jesus chased uh, the um, people who were uh, doing uh, business and then the money dealers changes in front of the temple. We have a Jesus that is very human. Yes. It is not something that is completely uh, without any emotion or Jesus that is beyond human touch. Yes. I think if we know a little bit more about the history of this text or where this woman comes from, we may emphasize more that Jesus might be responded correctly. Let me unpack this story a little bit for the audience, because Mark's gospel did not say that this woman is Canaanite. Mark's gospel mm -hmm. said the woman is a Syrophoenician woman. So sometimes we say that this is a story about a Syrophoenician woman and encountering Jesus. Now it is of significance if she is Syrophoenician. Why? From that background, she might be a Hellenized Syrophoenician person speaking Greek and also coming from the cities. While as Jesus from the Galilean hinterland would have experienced the kind of exploitation of the city dwellers of that time. Yes. So here you have a woman with some means and you have Jesus coming from the Galilean hinterland. And this may be Jesus saying to those who might have privilege in societies that, well, you do not think about those people who are in the hinterland and now you are begging for um, mercy. Whereas people from the hinterland, some of their food have been then just like today too and transferred to the other parts of the uh, city or the wealthier city dwellers, and they may not have enough to eat. So mm -hmm. then Jesus said, take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. May have more than, than meets the eyes. That mm -hmm. you might have not only a man and woman of different cultural and religious traditions, you might have a class difference there as mm -hmm. well. So yeah. if you look at it that way, and then it might not be as harsh as we could have imagined. Mm. That is why I think I look at it from that way. And Jesus may be saying, yes, I have come to help the, the, the Jews. And there are people who do not have food or do not have enough to eat. And I am not going just to the, take, take care of the people living in the city and they have plenty. And I think that uh, some scholars suggest Jesus might be saying something like this when Jesus said, not take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. It's harsh, 
But I think there might be some background to this particular verse. How interesting. Well, thank you so much for all of that. And, and thanks as well for the what I hear you saying about Jesus' sinlessness, not to confuse sinlessness with being inhumane, like his humanity and this, the doctrine of his sinlessness is making an entirely different point. It's kind of unrelated to his full humanity and his full humanity would, would definitely to be fully human include um, intellectual growth, um, growth in faith changes as well. But back to the story, back to the story. This is where in verse 27, this is, this is precisely where we see um, the Canaanite woman's um, grit, intellect, and wit, um, and even a kind of poetic imagination. Yes, Lord, even, yet even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. How fast and how fascinating um, to, to that retort. That is great. I must claim this as a mo model because she can think theologically. Yes. A woman of Canaanite background, isn't this? She be uphold as the foremother of women theologians. She was quick and then she <laughs> then um, took a position to change Jesus' mind. Isn't yes. this a great model? And instead of keeping silent, or instead of going away, or apologizing, and then she said, the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from the master's table. And in that way, she provided an opportunity for Jesus to rethink his answer and his ministry. So I think this is so uh, witty, and then uh, so uh, interesting as a woman theologian uh, claiming her as one of our four mothers. Absolutely. Um, that, that is so, so interesting. So would you, do you think it's fair to say that this is a story about Jesus changing his mind? Jesus answered her, great is your faith. At first, Jesus did not want to help her. But then, after that, Jesus suddenly changed his mind. And um, for the Mark Gospel said, for saying that, that is for saying what she just said, you may go and the demon has left. And so I think um, in many um, historical interpretations of this uh, particular text, the scholars will say uh, Jesus expanded his ministry and then not just helping the people in the house of Israel, but also see his ministry in a broader perspective. So that might be possible because Jesus praised her faith. Great is your faith. I want to shift to the next story um, in in this gospel. But before I do that, any any other thing you would like to say about the story? Yes, because I have read this uh, passage and have done some research on this uh, passage for some time. But I did not pay attention to a figure that was mentioned, which is the daughter. Yes. Isn't this interesting? And so uh, this um, woman's daughter was ill, and ill by what? Tormented by a demon. Now today, in uh, the 21st century, we may not believe in demon. But in Jesus' time, many people believed there were demons, and the daughter was possessed by a demon. So certainly, uh, that is why uh, this um, Canaanite woman came to beg Jesus. She might have tried many other means to heal her daughter, but her daughter was still sick. So out of last resort, 
Sue Kane, maybe she might have heard, Jesus uh, was a great healer and calm. But I think that I have read an indigenous Native American scholar talking about this daughter's illness, which really opens my eyes. Mm. So I want to share with the audience. And um, so uh, this um, uh, Native uh, scholar by the name of Laura Donaldson, and she said, I do not underestimate the significance of a daughter tormented by demon. Today, we may say this daughter is crazy or is mad. But then what leads to that illness? She might have possessed other forms of knowing. Right Today, we call uh, people mentally challenged instead of crazy, of course. But a mentally challenged people may look at the world differently. And so uh, Laura Donaldson asked us, especially from her native perspective, that her daughter might have seen the world in a different way. Mm. And the society might not accept that way of looking at the world. Just like many native or indigenous peoples way of life have not been fully accepted by the mainstream society. So when I read that interpretation, I said, ah, there was this one figure who has not spoken the daughter and properly marginalized because this is obviously a stigma, isn't it? And mm. when we look at this story, we have to pay attention to the so-called minor figures in the text too. We tend to forget her. So we have the Canaanite mother, we have Jesus, we have Jesus' disciples. But wait a minute, there is still this little daughter. Isn't this fascinating? It's fascinating. And that, that would be a nice summary of, um, or good example of what, your work in post-colonial theology is a testimony to pay attention to the quieter voices, the voices that aren't being heard, whether they're, that's in the story or in the community today that's interpreting those stories, say in the church. What voice is being left out and how can we give that person a microphone? How can we listen to that unheard voice? Yes, that is exactly uh, what I mean, that is to listen to the hidden voices or even the silenced ones. Well, the, the very next story, and I just want to do a quick nod to it, and then I'm going to highlight two of the questions that came in through the, through the chat, and then we'll finish up. The, the very next story in Matthew's gospel, and I think this is fascinating, it's, it's the feeding of the 4,000, follows immediately um, from, from this story. And the feeding of the 4,000, uh, it's, the, it's the version of the story where um, there's someone who supplies um, seven loaves and, and a few small fish. Um, the feeding occurs. And then in Matthew's version of the story, there are, there are um, Matthew notes that everyone eats, including men, women, and children. And he notes children eat. And at the end, after everyone's eating, he ate and everyone's well filled. Um, Matthew says they took up what was left over, all the broken pieces, and it was seven baskets full. So this image of just incredible abundance, just inc I mean, mind blowing abundance. And so it really looks to me like Matthew is pairing the story of the Canaanite woman with the with the feeding of the four thousand, and everything's just getting bigger and more imaginative and more generous and less scarce. Do you think that's fair? Yes, because uh, scholars have studied how this story of the Sinophonician woman or the Canaanite woman has been located in both gospels, Matthew and Mark. The story occurred at critical junction of Jesus' ministry, just as you said, as a prologue or as a forerunner to the larger story that is coming up, you know, feeling of uh, 4,000. 
So I think, again, it signifies for us the grace of God. Here it is the grace of God for a Canaanite woman. Later, you have the feeling of more people, more people can receive the gift from Jesus Christ. Yes. Well, we have two questions that have come in through the comments. One, uh, Broderick Greer has asked um, uh, about um, this story in relationship to Anglicanism. So the Anglican Communion of Churches, of which you're a part as an Episcopalian. And uh, Broderick asks, um, please expound on your interpretation of this passage um, as Anglicanism and the Christian faith um, let me read this correctly. Um, Anglican communities that are at the borders and ambiguity of contexts where Christianity is the minority religion. So in other words, where Anglican churches exist, where Christianity is the minority religion, how, how can this story shed light on, on, on kind of the kind of attitude and intellectual approach that those churches should take as a, as a minority um, group? Thank you very much for this uh, question. And as an Anglican, I belong to the communion with uh, Christians all over the world, more than 165 uh, countries. And that is why when we read stories like that, I paid attention to what I said, the context song. That is places where different people of different backgrounds meet. In Anglican church, we have Anglicans living in very difficult situations if you are a Christian. I'm talking about countries like Pakistan or in mostly majority countries. To preach the gospel, to witness to Christ is not easy. And this particular story opens our eyes to the possibilities. For example, this Canaanite woman with a different kind of religion or faith background can come to encounter Jesus. Now that is of course an invitation to our religious neighbor, come. You may find something that is inspiring or empowering for you. And then not only this story said, come, Jesus actually extended the mercy and compassion for these women. So I think the second thing we as Anglicans need to learn is have we worked with our religious neighbor? In what way, when our religious neighbor needed help, that do we offer the kind of support and solidarity? But most importantly, it is up to the woman to decide whether to follow Jesus or not. We bear witness. We offered our friendship, solidarity, and support. But the idea is not to force someone to follow my faith or religion. It's through that encounter that hopefully our religious neighbor will come to understand God in a way beyond our understanding. So I think this story is also a very interesting story if we are talking about how, as Anglicans, we live in a religiously pluralistic world, especially for our brothers and sisters who do not live in a Christian majority context. Fascinating. Thank you so much for that. We also have a um, second question from Tony Alumka, and Tony is actually um, one of your colleagues who is um, a professor at ILEP School of Theology. He's the Associate Professor of Sociology of Religion, and he is also a member here of the cathedral. And Tony asks, is this story, the Canaanite woman story, about the historical Jesus or about the early Jesus movement renegotiating its boundaries? Thank you very much, Tony for this uh, very important question. That is, whether this is from the early church. And um, this, of course, Matthew's gospel was written primarily for 
a Jewish audience. And that is why you have the son of David, that those kind of language in the story. So I would think uh, this is an interpretation of the Matthian community when they look back at Jesus' ministry and then they included this particular story. As for how much we know whether the encounter actually happened as recorded, I must say that, well, the interpretations can be various. Different people have different ideas. But I think, I believe, before the gospel was written in the way that it was written, people were talking about Jesus, sharing oral narratives, and then recalling what Jesus had done um, when Jesus was with them. And then over time, when they collected those oral narratives, and then, then it was uh, written and then formalized in the way that we are reading today. And when it was passed to us, I think for a long time, Christians were not so interested in the historical Jesus question. This was a modern question in the sense that we were interested in what Jesus actually said, Jesus actually uh, wore in his day. But for a long time in the Christian tradition, this story was told because they have found this story significant. And today, I dare say, the story, when it is interpreted in a post-colonial way, would not be just for Christian. It is also for our religious neighbor. And I want to emphasize it today. It is not just a story about Jesus or about the Christian community. It has great insight of how the meeting of these Canaanite women expand Jesus' ministry. And today, we follow the same example of expanding our own horizon through meeting the religious other. Mm. Pulan, I am so grateful. What I've learned from you is that this is a story um, about mutual flourishing, how groups um, of, of different kinds meet at borders or boundaries that are contested and complex, and that in the presence of, of um, intellectual gritty faith, like that of the Canaanite woman, and in the presence of Christ, who is who's open and willing to be changed by others and loving, that, that mutual flourishing can occur. And God knows, and we know, um, that we need a lot more of that today. So may that mutual flourishing come for all of God's children. And above all, thank you so much. Pulan, I, I hope we get to meet in person one day. I cannot wait for you to come um, and be here in person at the cathedral. We would love to host you. Thank you for your, um, your, your, your generosity with your time. Um, thank you for your incredible intellect, which is a great gift to us. It's a great gift to the Anglican communion um, and to this world. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dean Lawson, for your very kind invitation. It was a lot of fun doing Bible study. Next time, I promise, when I am in Denver, I'm going to visit the cathedral because I have not done that. And I look forward to that day to see you in person and see the cathedral. Dr. Kwok, thank you. And thank you to everyone who joined us. God bless you and have a wonderful evening.